Today, I'm going to talk about the role of FHE and encryption in intent-centric architectures. I'm John from Fluton. So I'd like to start with... It's not working. Okay. So I'd like to start with what FHE is. So FHE stands for Fully Homomorphic Encryption. Uh, fully Homomorphic Encryption allows computations uh, over encrypted messages, which means ciphertext. So uh, FHE allows to do like uh, mathematical operations like multiplication, addition on encrypted texts without decrypting them. So on the diagram, you can see that uh, that's your device and you are sending some kind of data uh, to a cloud server. And uh, with the help of HTTPS, uh, it's uh, defaultly encrypted in transit. But when the data reaches their cloud servers, uh, the data gets decrypted because they need to process that data. So uh, that's, that, that shouldn't be happening because like, when the data is decrypted on the cloud servers, uh, they can reach your data and that's probably not what you want. Uh, you want to keep your data private. So that's why your data should remain encrypted in processing. That's what uh, FHE uh, is doing. working um, yeah so this is just some example on how FHE works so like uh, on the blue box you can see that uh, there is X and there is Y so when you try to add X and Y together uh, without decrypting them uh, you get the value of X and Y encrypted and as an example if you try to add two and three uh, as encrypted data you get the value five and it remains encrypted as well Yeah, so uh, one thing I should mention is that FHE is not ZKP, zero knowledge proofs, because FHE allows to process and perform computations over the encrypted data without decrypting. But zero knowledge proofs allows to prove knowledge of a certain information without exposing the information itself. For example, the FHE allows to calculate uh, the lung cancer risk of a patient without sending the patient's data plainly, but Z zero knowledge proofs uh, for example, unlocking your phone by entering the password without revealing it proves that you know the password. So FHA allows to perform some kind of operation on the encrypted data, while on the other hand, zero knowledge proofs allows you to prove the, prove the data, prove that you know it. So why are we using FHE? Why do we need it? Because on-chain data is public by design, making it hard to build tabs that require confidentiality. Uh, and MEV attacks are possible, resulting in hidden tags on every transaction. Uh, because like when you're sending a swap transaction uh, on the mempool, it stays there, and uh, every MEV attacker can front run you because they know the details of the transaction. With the help of FHE, the data remains encrypted during the life cycle of the process. So this way you won't be able to get MEV attacked because they don't know anything about the transaction details. Examples include transferring X amount of tokens to your friend, uh, which we call private transfers, or bidding Y ETH uh, for a pudgy penguin in an auction, for example, or voting Z for the next president of USA. Uh, as you can see, those data remain encrypted, and uh, that's how homomorphic encryption works. Uh, you can process data and perform computations without decrypting it. So what are intents? I'm pretty sure you guys uh, are familiar with the term, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. Transactions specify specific actions, and they are declarative, but intents specify desired outcomes. That's why uh, intents are different from the transactions. On the transactions, you specify the path you want to execute on, but on intents, you don't have to specify the path. You, you, just, you just say what you want as an outcome. So it's basically like abstraction of the execution path from the end user. And the solvers are responsible for finding the best execution path. So the user doesn't try to find the best execution path. The solvers are responsible for doing that. So why we need intents? Because uh, it provides much better UX, uh, because the, the user is just entering some kind of intent on the front end, for example. And it's much faster than cross-chain messaging because cross-chain messaging systems usually wait for the finality on source chain to happen, uh, which intents do not wait for the finality, usually. And it helps unifying the liquidity as well. So here's a comparison of transactions uh, versus intents. 
Um, so for example, a transaction is I want to swap my one ETH for at least 2K USDC on Uniswap. So you basically uh, declare the execution path, the, declare the protocol, which is Uniswap here. But if you declare this as an intent, it means like uh, I want to swap one ETH for as much USDC as possible. So uh, the solvers are responsible for finding that amount, uh, the best execution path. Or for example, transaction, I want to stake my 1K DAI on Aave for 2% API, that's a transaction. While an intent is, I want to stake my 1K DAI and I want to generate the highest APY as possible. That's the power of intents. Yeah, so uh, as Fluton, we decided to put the FHG into intents and call it FH intents. Uh, some genius actually called it FH intense, and we liked it, so we decided to go with the term FH intense. So, uh, as an example, you can say, like, I want to swap X ETH to USDC on Ethereum and receive the USDC on Optimism. So, this X represents the encrypted part. Uh, so you, you guys may think of like a uh, tornado cash maybe from this example because like I'm hiding the details of the transaction like nobody knows how much ETH the guy is transferring or swapping and that kind of uh, that, that might kind of sound like tornado cash but actually it's a much more different system and I'll just come into that in a later slide. So there are some challenges of H intents. Uh, they are hard to implement and grasp because like how is the relayer supposed to fulfill the intent if they don't know the details? Like they have to know the details to fulfill it. Uh, so it might like uh, hard to think of, but I'll uh, explain it on the diagrams. Uh, so different FHE schemes across chains, like what if the, what if the ciphertext is not recognized on target chain? So we are talking about the uh, encrypted interoperability interoperability in different chains. So like one chain difference FHG scheme and the other chain uh, supports like some kind of different FHG scheme then those two chains are not going to recognize each other's encrypted text. So like how is it going to work? And the third uh, part is legal stuff because like encryption might uh, come up uh, as bad as uh, in legal terms. So like for example, isn't this tornado cache? It's not, like I mentioned. I'll just come into that in later slides. So, oops. Can we go back? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So, uh, in an ideal case, no one should be able to see the intent details on both the source chain uh, and the target chain, including the relay, because if you are encrypting your intent, uh, you should keep it private in, in the life cycle of the whole transaction. And the ERC20 tokens don't work because in, uh, the, all of the ERC20 tokens uh, have a function called transfer uh, in their smart contract code. And that transfer function actually emits an event at the end, uh, which allows uh, different users to be able to see the amount, the receiver, etc. And that's what we want to hide. So uh, the normal ERC20 tokens are not compatible in this architecture. So we need an encrypted ERC20 standard. So as you can see on the diagram, uh, the user says, hey, I want to uh, send X ETH from Ethereum to Optimism. Like, can someone help? And uh, they encrypt their amount. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, in a blue box. It's locked, so it's, uh, it's encrypted. So the relayer see this uh, intent. They try to uh, fulfill that intent, but before they, uh, they fulfill it, they have to like check if they have enough balance in their wallets. But since the data is encrypted, how are they supposed to check it? Because like they don't know the amount of the intent. So uh, on the bottom, uh, there is a simulate function on our smart contract, uh, which allows relayers to simulate the intent, whether they are able to fulfill it or not. And that simulation doesn't reveal any kind of data during the simulation. That only returns true or false. At just a simple Boolean, whether they are able to fulfill that intent or not. So all of the relayers take the uh, encrypted amount, they compare it homomorphically with uh, their balance, and if they return the value true from the simulation function, uh, it means they are able to fulfill that intent, and if they return false, then they are not uh, able to fulfill that intent. 
So for example, uh, at the top, you can see that uh, the relayer, one of the relayers is red because they don't have enough balance to fulfill it. Basically, the simulation result is false. Uh, the other relayers are able to fulfill that intent, so they try to, uh, they start to give their offers. For example, the middle, uh, the relayer in the middle says, I can fulfill this for 1% fee, and the bottom relayer says, I can fulfill it for 1% fee, and they give their offers. And on the front end, uh, the user chooses the best offer for them. So when the user chooses the best offer, uh, they basically sign, uh, sign a transaction on the smart contract and escrow their tokens. So basically they lock their tokens on the smart contract and they authorize uh, the relayer to fulfill that intent. So the relayer fulfills the intent on the target chain smart contract and as a result, uh, the user receives their tokens. And when the intent is fulfilled, I'm using Union's infrastructure for sending cross-chain message to the source network. And when the uh, source network smart contract receives that message, uh, the escrow tokens, the lock tokens, get released to the relayer. And the intent is completely fulfilled. So what if the FHE schemes were different? Uh, in that example, I told that uh, the FHE schemes are the same, and when you encrypt something on source chain, the, tar the target chain can recognize and do homomorphic operations on that uh, encrypted text. But if the FHE schemes were different, then it won't be the case. The target chain won't be able to like recognize the text on the source chain. So re-encryption is needed for this. Uh, intent details are revealed to the authorized relayer in this case, because the relayer decrypts the intent, then re-encrypts the uh, intent again, so the target chain is able to recognize it and perform homomorphic encryption, homomorphic operations, sorry. Uh, so what if, yeah, uh, so first of all, user encrypts their intent in a way that only the authorized relayer is able to decrypt, so it's the part of the public key cryptography. And the authorized relayer decrypts the intent and re-encrypts it with the target chain's FHE scheme. And the re-encrypted intent is fulfilled on the target chain. So let's talk about the legal stuff now. Uh, you, might, you might have thought that uh, the system might look like Tornado Cash. Oops. But uh, the Tornado Cash actually hides the trace between the sender and receiver, while Fluton hides the amount between the sender and the receiver. So Tornado Cash uses a system called mixers, and the mixers uh, completely hides the trace between the sender and the receiver. So the sender sends some tokens to the mixer, and when they receive it as a different user, the trace becomes uh, almost impossible to be able to trace that transaction. But we, as a Fluton, as Fluton, hide the amount. So we don't hide the trace between the sender and the receiver. Uh, so those are some good explanations, but a demo is worth a thousand words. So if I have some time, I'd like to show you the demo we built. Do I have time? Okay, I'm just going to the computer now.
Okay, so sorry for taking a long time. So here's the uh, demo we built. So basically, uh, in the middle of the screen, you can see a transfer card here, and you can uh, choose the networks here. For example, uh, as a source network, I choose Phoenix, and as a target network, I choose Zamas network. The reason why I choose these networks is that they support uh, a technology called FHEVM, uh, which allows us to perform homomorphic, en homomorphic operations on the encrypted text. So let's, uh, as a user, just type one here. And when I type one here, I basically send, uh, send the data to the release that, uh, hey, there's a guy who wants to send some tokens from Phoenix to Zama, but uh, I don't tell anything about the amount. So I basically give the information of networks, the token itself, but I don't say any details about the amounts. So when I enter one here, uh, at the bottom input, you can see that I got 0 0.99, which means I'm going to receive 0 0.99 uh, USDC on Zama. So when I click the bridge button here, uh, currently the uh, intent is getting encrypted here. And the intent is encrypted. Uh, the transaction is being confirmed on the MetaMask. So. Uh, I just confirmed the first one. Let's just reject the second one. So intent is being encrypted uh, and it's being uh, submitted into uh, source network right now. And then the intent is being relayed to the relayer. So the relayer sees the intent. It's completely encrypted. They try to run the simulation on the target chain. Uh, they are able to fulfill it and go, they go ahead and fulfill it on the target network. So when the intent is fulfilled, uh, I'd like to show you the transaction details on the scanner. So this is a transaction we just sent. And as you can see, I basically called a function called bridge WERC20 uh, function, which takes four parameters, the encrypted to, encrypted amount, relayer address, and the relayer seal. So uh, we try to encrypt the re receiver on the target network as well. Uh, this is just for testing purposes, and we were able to actually uh, hide the receiver on the target chain. But uh, in the la latest product, in the final product, uh, we won't uh, do this because, like I said, uh, it might like lead to tornado cache stuff because uh, then if we encrypt the receiver on the target chain, then it becomes like near impossible to trace the transaction. So we are not going to do this in the final product. But you can see here that the encrypted amount is a bunch of gibberish. Uh, this is clearly not the amount I encrypted on the front end. I just entered one on the front end, and this is obviously not one. So this means that the one got encrypted here, and it got submitted on the Phoenix. Then the relayer actually fulfilled that on the target chain. And when the transaction is uh, completed, I got my uh, USDC 0 0.99 USDC on the target network. So yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Actually, uh, special thanks to the union team as well uh, for uh, making me a speaker uh, here. Thank you so much. And you can also reach us at Fluton.io on X and mail us your feedbacks on contact at Fluton.io. Thank you so much.